When the Democrats gathered in Charleston, South Carolina in 1860 to nominate a presidential candidate, they were already primed for failure. The party adopted a rule that any nominee required a two-thirds majority of the assembled delegates. It was almost a certainty that Stephen Douglas could lead a united Democratic Party to victory in the upcoming election. But the problem for Douglas was that his Freeport Doctrine had made him unacceptable to most Southerners. The two-thirds rule gave the South a veto over the nominee and they intended to exercise it in Charleston. Douglas finished first on 57 ballots but could not get over the two-thirds hurdle. Deadlocked, the convention broke up and the Northern Democrats reconvened in Baltimore and nominated Stephen Douglas. The Southern insurgents also convened in Baltimore and nominated John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. With the Democrats fatally divided, Lincoln's election was almost certain, and if Lincoln won, the South was certain to secede. Despite Lincoln's many assurances to Southerners that as president, he would have no right or inclination to interfere with slavery in Dixie, the fire eaters of the South were unwilling to accept a union with a black Republican president. Beginning with South Carolina on December 20th, 1860, and concluding with Texas on February 23rd, 1861, seven of the southernmost states seceded individually from the Union. That same February, the rebellious South formed the Confederate States of America at Montgomery, Alabama, and named Jefferson Davis of Mississippi their provisional president. At the same time secessionitis gripped the South, there were several attempts underway to reach a compromise that would restore the Union and avert civil war. It is in the midst of this crisis that Abraham Lincoln wrote to his old friend, Representative Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia. My dear sir, your obliging answer to my short note is just received, and for which please accept my thanks. I fully appreciate the peril the country is in, and the weight of responsibility on me. From the moment of his election, Abraham Lincoln was under pressure to sign on to some compromise measure that would surrender the very ground on which he had built his victory, preventing the spread of slavery into the territories. On every other Southern grievance, real or imagined, Lincoln believed there was room for compromise. But on the further spread of slavery, the president-elect intended to hold fast as with a chain of iron. A few days before Lincoln wrote to Stevens, Senator John J. Crittenden of Kentucky introduced a proposal amounting to a series of unamendable constitutional amendments guaranteeing the existence of slavery in the southern states and the District of Columbia. Additionally, this Crittenden Compromise would reinstate the old Missouri Compromise line and allow for slavery in any territory south of that line. Many southern senators saw promise in Crittenden's proposal, but it was rejected outright by Lincoln and the Republicans. Lincoln continued. Do the people of the South really entertain fears that a Republican administration would directly or indirectly interfere with their slaves or with them about their slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you as once a friend and still I hope not an enemy that there is no cause for such fears. Lincoln received the Republican nomination in 1860 because of his moderate record on slavery. Much to the ire of abolitionists, since 1854, 
The president-elect freely acknowledged the fact that slavery was a state's rights issue. He recognized the right of Southerners to hold their property and their right to recover that property under any law that was not as likely to carry off a free man as it was a runaway. Lincoln had consistently explained his views, but most Southerners refused to listen. The South, Lincoln continued, would be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of Washington. I suppose, however, this does not meet the case. You think slavery is right and ought to be extended, while we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. That, I suppose, is the rub. It certainly is the only substantial difference between us. In that final paragraph of this short note, Mr. Lincoln succinctly summed up the very thing that had brought the South to secession and the nation to the brink of civil war. From the moment of its founding, the United States had been fraught with sectional conflicts, culture, commerce, industry, tariffs, banks, and internal improvements had, at one point or another, created friction. None had proved so difficult to resolve, nor so dangerous to the nation, as slavery's expansion. The abolition of slavery would one day become the central issue of the Civil War. But that lay in the future. What Mr. Lincoln's short note to Alexander H. Stevens tells us is that slavery's expansion, not its abolition, was the war's principal cause. Land of cotton, old time there, I'm not forgotten. Look away, look away.